All right, everybody, why don't we uh, why don't we take a seat and get started? I'm going to state the obvious, but this is the Wharf District Council's August meeting. Welcome, everyone. Get gas in in person. And um, so we're some of us are wearing masks still, and hopefully that will end someday. But in the meantime, feel free to wear a mask or um, take it off at your uh, at your discretion. Uh, the mayor is expected at around 5:30, I think. Uh, in the meantime. We uh, have a number of electeds here that we'd like to uh, acknowledge. Uh, I know that uh, uh, Representative Mikulitz is always oh, here. Oh, good, right. terrific. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, and um, we also have State Representative John Rogers, who's here as well. And uh, John. Uh, and um, State Representative uh, Adrian Madaro may be here as well. Um, okay, great. Uh, see our own city councilor Ed Flynn Ed. and um, city councilor at large uh, Julia Mahia. Is that if I pronounce that correctly? Here? No? Uh, and of course, we have uh, and it's going to be uh, first on our uh, agenda uh, the um, Reverend Mariana White Hammond, who is the chair of the Environment, Energy, and Open Space. Is that right? Okay. Yeah, it's a big um, time. Right. Um, uh, Representative Mikowitz, we are incredibly indebted to you for having uh, managed to get some funding for our climate task force. Thank you very much. Thank you. I know Representative Rogers was involved in that as well. Um, Representative Mikowitz, you anything that you'd like to say to the gang? Sure. Your choice. <laughs> So thank you, Mark. Good afternoon, everyone. It's good to see everyone. Uh, uh, I know it's been a little while uh, because of obviously uh, the pandemic, but it's nice to see everyone, and I hope everyone's having a good summer as best as we possibly can. I just wanted to come down and say hello uh, and uh, say just a couple things that we have been working on. Uh, we did do, we did have the budget, and we did do a piece in there uh, for climate resiliency uh, discussions along uh, the Wharf District, which I think is obviously. Uh, prevalent uh, and maybe the, one of the most important things, conversations that we're having uh, currently uh, in government. And I think it's on all levels of government, city, state, and federal, uh, as it needs to be. Uh, and we all need to step up to the plate in different ways. But I know from a community standpoint, uh, there's a, this is a, a, a local issue. So some people, this is just a discussion about something that's happening somewhere else in the, in the world or somewhere else in their, in, their, in, their, in their area. This is actually happening on our front door. Uh, and so this is something that we have to continue to be vigilant on and, and continue to have conversations uh, uh, in, in productive ones at that. And I'm looking forward to doing that further uh, at the state level. It, we are uh, in the midst of, and just getting a budget piece was, was, was important, but I think there's a lot more, uh, certainly there's conversations that have to be done. One of them that is coming up is a lot, what to do with this federal money that we have, uh, that uh, the state has been given. Uh, it's close to $5 billion. Uh, with a wide variety of discretion uh, related to how we, uh, what we can do with it. Uh, we have to be uh, uh, proactive uh, on a lot of fronts and we're having open and transparent meetings. I know there was, a, I don't know if you read in the paper, there was a little back and forth about who should control this money uh, between the governor and the legislature. Uh, some, some folks, rightfully so, think the legislature sometimes slows things down. I think that uh, in this case, it's important that we do uh, because we do have to make sure we get this right. This is, a one, this is the most money we've ever received in a one-time revenue. Uh, in the state's history, and there are so many, there's so many things out there that are neat, that are needful, including climate, including housing, including a whole host of other things. I can go on and on and on. Uh, and we need to be thoughtful and proactive, but also transparent in terms of this. We want to make sure everyone has an opportunity to have a seat at the table. We've been doing that with, with hearings that we had in July, and we're going to continue to have those uh, in September. And so I welcome anybody's input or thoughts uh, related to that going forward. Uh, I appreciate uh, the opportunity uh, to say a few words. I also just want to mention. Uh, what I did, what I chose to do in relation to the Boston Municipal Harbor Plan, uh, most recently, a letter that I sent, I sent it over to Mark, I sent it to Suzanne, uh, John Rogers has it as well, I think uh, we're going to get anybody that reached out to us, we're going to make sure you get a copy of that letter and see what we, 
what we said. And what we said was very clear that if we're going to move forward, um, you know, if the ruling that the courts laid down uh, is the ruling that stands, then this thing should go through a legislative process, not a regulatory process. Regulatory process is important and, and, and meaningful, but this is an important change in discussion related to Chapter 91 licenses. Uh, and we don't feel that it shouldn't just be something done on a regulatory basis. There should be hearings, there should be discussions, there should be transparency, there should be a whole host of discussions related to how we should do this moving forward. And I'm willing to take on that issue as, you know, as, as your legislator, as, as, your, as the member of the House here, I'm ready to take on that discussion because this is not just about what's going on here. This is about harbor plans across the entire uh, Commonwealth. And so I have a whole host of, of colleagues that are interested in it. One of them is Representative Madero, who is on his way from East Boston. Uh, he's, uh, you know, has a, uh, obviously we, we share districts across the harbor from each other, and he has a very big interest in this as well. So I assure you that, that what, that's where, where we stood on the, on the letter by sending it, and that's where we stand on this discussion, and we hope that that's the way that this thing goes. Uh, we don't think it should be a regulatory uh, conversation. It should be a legislative conversation. So I thank you all for, for weighing in on that discussion, and I look forward to further conversations uh, with that going forward. Thank you, Mark, for giving me a few minutes to say hello, and good to see everyone. Council Quinn, anything you'd like to add to that? I meant to mention that this is being recorded for those folks who are not here. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you, Mark, and it's good to be with you and with Suzanne. I have great respect for you and Suzanne and the entire Wolf District Council. Good to be with uh, Reverend Hammond as well. I also want to say thank you to Aaron Michaelitz, who's done an outstanding job being a tremendous leader in this community as well. Um, over the last four years, what I've tried to do as your district city councilor is to work on your behalf to stress to City Hall that this is a neighborhood. It's a neighborhood that is, is entitled to basic city services. It's not just a place where visitors go or tourists go, but it's a place where people pay high property taxes, and you want safe streets, you want clean parks, you want a transportation system that works, um, a clean harbor, um, access to the harbor. And that's what I've tried to focus on as your district city councilor, kind of the nuts and bolts of city government, making sure it's working for you. I work with um, A1 police captain weekly almost, and we have to make sure we have a police presence in and around this neighborhood, in and around the financial district as well. We do see crime creeping up at various locations across the city. So it is important to have um, police presence throughout, throughout the district, throughout the neighborhood. Um, the other thing I tried to do as your district city councilor is to be accessible to you, to answer questions, to respond to emails, to come out to meetings like this. And I'm just so wanted to represent you. I'm gonna continue working hard on your behalf make sure you get the basic city services, improve your quality of life, and um, to be there for you and to um, help you navigate city and state services, working closely with Aaron Michaelitz and with my colleagues as well on the, on the city council and the mayor. So I just wanna say thank you for giving me this opportunity. I'm running for re-election. I'm running unopposed, but I will be on the ballot in November. Um, there won't be another candidate next to me but I just wanted to come by and respectfully ask for your vote in November. And I hope to continue working hard for you um, over the next two years again. Thank you, everybody. We want to echo our appreciation, uh, uh, Captain Chicola, to you and the rest of your uh, crew for keeping us safe. We very much appreciate that. Um, I know that uh, Reverend, Reverend uh, White Hammond is very familiar with our Climate Resilience Task Force and that your staff keeps you apprised of our ongoing efforts. We uh, think of this as being an a, a important and unique public-private partnership that uh, is, we hope, going to make a big difference, but unfortunately over a long period of time. And we look forward to working with you uh, closely but we also look forward to your vision for how you're going to be uh, managing this and the other issues that you deal with. And we welcome you today to uh, tell us a little bit about it. 
it's good um, to be with you. Um, I think this is only my second community meeting in person. We've been living our Zoom lives. Um, and so I have to say it's, it's good um, to be out with you. I, I'll keep my um, remarks pretty brief. I know the, the mayor will arrive um, pretty soon and I know she'll have things to share. And uh, we are here also mostly to uh, engage in some dialogue and be uh, available for any questions you might have. But I, I'll briefly share a few things um, that we are focusing on, particularly in the environment department. Although I do, I, I was I was joking, but it's actually not a joke. I do oversee everything from archaeology to animal control. So I might have one of the most <laughs> diverse departments in terms of um, what we're focused on. So I think, um, as was said, we've been doing uh, a lot of planning in the city. And I think that's been important. Um, it's given us an opportunity to really dig deep into what we need to do. We are the fourth most vulnerable city in America in terms of climate change. Um, and you live he right here by the waterfront. So I, I'm sure many of you have seen firsthand the water is rising. Climate change is not something that's happening down the line. It's something that's very real and very present. Um, I've had the opportunity to uh, talk with folks on the ground um, in New York who experienced Sandy. I think many of us know that a few hours difference, and it could have been us instead of them. And so part of what the Environment Department is really taking seriously is continuing to plan, continuing to be thoughtful, continuing to learn what other folks are doing. But we also need to move from, from planning to, to action. Um, we recognize that we have enough um, sort of projects in the pipeline that we can start beginning to implement um, some of what we've learned and begin to get started on funding these projects. That's, of course, um, there are two uh, big things I would want to point out is that one, we are looking as much as possible for nature based solutions. Um, we are trying our best to really look at how we can use open space as a buffer um, and where, where there are opportunities to really lean into natural solutions. Um, that's something that we, we are really doing. And the second thing is that we're really equity focused. We're asking the question, um, where are folks gonna suffer the most? Um, where are they gonna have the least resources um, to support themselves? Which are the communities um, that have been most left out um, in that conversation? And I, I will briefly, uh, I know this community really is, uh, is very, very much focused on sea level rise and we will continue to do that work which we have been doing for years. It, it is worth noting that we've also been taking a pretty hard look at heat issues um, because sea level rise is, is an issue and it is clearly dramatic. But if you look at the numbers, it's actually more people are dying from heat related issues and climate change because heat is more of a silent killer. Um, they don't report on the news. It doesn't have um, the storm tracking that comes along with the hurricane and some of these other instances. And so we are paying particularly um, important attention to heat. Um, this neighborhood is um, a little better off because you're on the water. I live in Dorchester and the water helps us too. It brings, even if it gets hot during the day, um, the cooling airs from the water help bring our temperatures down at, at, in the evening. But our, you are not far from our most heat affected neighborhood, which is Chinatown. It by far has some of the highest daytime temperatures, but what's also more dangerous is it has our highest nighttime temperatures. And that means that people don't get relief even when they're sleeping. And as you know, there's not a lot of space to throw in extra parks or, or even trees because of the challenges in terms of space. So, um, you know, I hope that as, as you're paying attention to the work that we're doing, um, that heat question is, is also really important, something um, that we're paying close attention to. I just I forgot we didn't bring cooling towels, Allison. <laughs> All last week, we were bringing cooling towels everywhere that we, we were. The temperatures did come down a little bit this week, but um, if you're experiencing heat, um, we do have some suggestions on our website about things that you can do. Um, to reduce, to reduce heat. The other thing worth noting is that the places in our um, city that deal with the highest heat temperatures are also the communities in our city that were redlined in the 70s and well, really is 50s, 60s, 70s, a number of years. Um, and so we are looking at that as an equity issue. In the past, folks make concrete decisions not to invest in those communities and we are seeing the effects. Um, so that, that is one area that we're working on. We also are working on some food justice work. 
Um, and for many people saw in COVID, we saw a lot of folks that were impacted um, by an inability to access food at all in some instances, but particularly healthy and affordable food is a challenge. And so we are looking at, um, in my own cabinet and in, in, in sort of open space, are there ways for us to open up um, more of our open spaces to also be available as places for people to plant and grow? And we've been really excited to work with the Department of Neighborhood Development on that. But I think um, this, this um, group is, I think, particularly concerned about sea level rise. And, and that's one area where we're, again, moving from planning to action. And this period is pretty important because, as uh, Rep. Michael had said, that there's a lot of money flowing into the city in this moment. And the question is, how can we make sure that as much of that as possible is beginning to address some of the resilience issues that we have? We're looking at ARPA funds and infrastructure funds and funds of the city and funds of the state. And so we do um, want to invite you to be engaged in that conversation um, because sometimes there are lots of energy and they're all important. And we think that there are ways to address housing and climate change. We think there are ways to address open space and climate change. We know that quite a bit of money is coming to water and sewer. So we've been sort of saying, how can we use the resources to do upgrades, but do them in such a way that we're also going to increase resiliency um, in the city. Um, and so we, we would love to partner with you as we look through, think through, um, really get serious about mapping most deeply what our, our most urgent projects are and begin to think about how it's getting done. I do know that in terms of the nature-based solutions, this area has slight challenges because much of the infrastructure is built and built right up to the water. Um, and that makes it a little bit harder to do um, some of what we've done, for instance, in Mobley Park in Dorchester, where we've really said, how can we look at the beach and, and that open space actually as a, as a basin that will catch water and prevent it from going forward? We're looking at some of those same solutions in East Boston, clearly here. Um, you can look at Christopher Columbus, right? There's some places, but, but we'll, we probably will have to do more in the way of seawalls just because um, there's just not quite as much land to work with to make sure that we have that buffer zone. Uh, so I wanted um, really quickly to name one more piece and then I, I um, want to definitely be open to your questions and concerns. This is the first time I've, I've been before this group, but I have gotten some briefing from my staff about the conversations and the relationships that we've built over the last few years working on um, climate resilience and really talking about what's possible um, in this area. The last piece is um, really wanting to engage more deeply in this conversation. I know many of you have reached out about NHP, about um, what we can do around open space and how we can make um, open space in this area that is open, not just, I know we have many visitors from other places um, that come and use the open space, but how we actually more deeply link it um, to other cities and other, other parts of the city and other communities. Um, this, I grew up going to the Children's Museum probably into my teens. I went to the teen night. I remember we got very upset when they would allow the middle schoolers to go into the teen space. That was like a social justice issue around which we were willing to organize. Um, but, um, but it is also true that many folks don't access enough the waterfront here. I think there's some of us who have still remember the days when um, they told you that if you fell into the harbor or into the Charles River, you had to rush immediately to the hospital and get a tetanus shot. Um, and a lot of work has been done to change that situation. Um, and so one of the questions is, how can we do a better job inviting more Bostonians down to see and to celebrate the important work that was done to clean the harbor up? Because it wasn't just done by government, quite frankly. I'm sure there are folks in this room um, who were part of robust citizen efforts to organize uh, and begin to move the idea that we did not have to settle for a dirty harbor that something better was possible, and that if we mobilize together, we could reach that. So with that, I think I um, will stop there um, and, and open the questions. Allison Brizius is here. I know the mayor will be here in a moment. Um, but I did want to make sure that I also was responsive, because I could go on and on talking about I'm a preacher, so <laughs> I could go all night. <laughs> but, but I know that part of uh, the intention was for us to also hear what some of the sort of core concerns um, and questions are. Well, thank you very much. Uh, you know, I heard what you said about natural solutions, which is 
problem, but is it really economically and technologically feasible? We read about these rising, we read about the rising tides over the next few decades, and I don't think a seawall is going to hold it back. I mean, what can we really do? Yeah, I mean, so I'll, I'll tell you that we are in conversation because I think it's not one thing that's going to fix everything. So um, I'm sure some of you have heard about um, the sea islands are one of our most important protections that are keeping the city safe. Um, there is a, a burgeoning conversation about whether or not to augment those, potentially even to build other um, islands in that chain that serve as a buffer to prevent uh, sort of large levels of, of water from making it its way in quickly. I mean, another thing that I, I, I'll say that we've also, and I, I, how many people have read any piece of the IPCC report this, this week? All right. Um, so, you know, this is my field, so I read it every time. Um, I highly suggest a glass of wine if you can. What is that? What is that? IPCC is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. It's all the UN scientists get together about every five years and they release a new report on what we know about climate change. Um, it's always sobering. This one did not disappoint. Um, what it said is, um, as early as 10 years ago, the idea was that we should not allow the temperature to surpass 1.5 degrees Celsius. Um, they sort of showed us what would happen at 1.5 degrees Celsius. There was a lot of things we didn't want. And then they showed us what would happen at 2 degrees Celsius. And it was even worse. Um, what the report said on Monday is last Monday that we have passed the point where we can stop at the level of 1.5 degrees Celsius. That at this point, we're just going to try to not hit two. Um, and so I, I will say part of the challenge that we experience is there's a, all of us want to intervene. I do think you're right. We, um, if we do not also do some work to stop um, putting more carbon in the atmosphere, then you're right, no seawall is going to save us. Um, and so we have to balance our adaptation work um, with our work to make sure that we are reducing our carbon in the atmosphere. And I'll talk about that on the other side. Um, I, Thank you for I'll give me a second. With one, one thing that we are partnering with the city council is on um, a building emissions performance standard that um, says if we're going to live the ravages of climate change, we also have to take a leadership role in reducing our emissions. And a small number of our buildings are, are pretty significant sources of a lot of our emissions. So we'll come back to that afterwards. Um, Mayor, uh, so I, I will introduce uh, to some, um, but many of you know our mayor. Um, she has been doing work. I, I met her many years ago. We were both doing education advocacy work. Um, the spirit that she had then was really about how to use um, our creative, all our creativity to find solutions that would serve our most struggling students. And I think she's um, brought that focus on innovation and focus on, on reaching those who needed the most into the way that she uh, runs as mayor. Um, she is Boston's first black and first female mayor. Um, and I'll be honest, as a, a girl that grew up here in Roxbury, I don't know that I imagined as a little girl that we would have um, a, a woman of color from Roxbury as a mayor of our city, but I am excited to be part of the administration at this time. And so I, with no further ado, um, will hand it over to our mayor, Mayor Kim Green. Thank you so much, uh, Chief White Hammond. Uh, it is a pleasure to be here. Uh, my, name, my name is Kim Janey, and I am uh, the 55th mayor of Boston. I grew up here uh, in the city, uh, born and raised. Uh, this is the city that I love, the city that gave me so much. And so I will always uh, give my all uh, back to Boston. Um, I want to thank you, Mark. Uh, I want to thank you for your leadership. I want to thank everyone. Uh, for being here, Suzanne, 
I want to uh, certainly uh, lift up uh, the chief of uh, environment, energy, and open space uh, for her incredible work. I'm so grateful to have her on my team. And I will uh, just say outright, I never imagined. So <laughs> I will own it. I never imagined uh, that we would be here. And I certainly didn't imagine that it would be me. Uh, but I am grateful uh, for growing up in this city, particularly in the time that I grew up in, the 1970s and 80s, uh, and all of the lessons that I learned along the way. Um, and I am grateful that we are here. I think we have come a long way as a city, and I know we have more work to do, uh, but I am encouraged because of residents like you, who care so deeply for Boston, who are doing good work every single day. I want to uh, acknowledge uh, that um, you know, I started my a, a career in elected office on the Boston City Council, uh, and I proudly represented District 7. I represent the entire city now. Um, I became the first woman uh, to represent District 7, but before I held that seat, it was held by uh, former city councilor Tito Jackson, who just walked into the room. I'm sure he's already gotten a shout out, but certainly wanted to acknowledge him uh, here today. And I believe uh, Mariama White Hammond's predecessor is also here. Is he here? Aha, uh -huh, there you are. Hey, Chris. Uh, so I also want to recognize uh, Chief Cook uh, for being an incredible partner, uh, certainly to me, the city of Boston, for the amazing work you did uh, with the city and what you continue to do now at the Greenway. I also want to recognize Boston City Councilor uh, Ed Flynn, who is here. Uh, Ed, it is always a pleasure uh, to see you, uh, and I'm certainly grateful uh, for your partnership. I believe there are other electeds here. Is Aaron here? Yes. There he is. Uh, we can't do this alone in the city of Boston, and I am so grateful. Oh, and I want to get to him too. <laughs> I'm going to start with Aaron Michaelwitz, though. Uh, you know working with the Boston City Council, working with my administration, working with the residents of this city uh, is great, but we also need strong advocates at the state. Uh, and I am certainly grateful for the work of, of Aaron Michael Witz and how he has been a fierce a champion for the city of Boston. Uh, as a resident uh, in this area, I'm just grateful to have his, his leadership and his partnership. Uh, Adrian Madaro as well, uh, just talked to you uh, this morning uh, always on top of it, always present, always showing up, uh, making sure that your constituents are well served. Uh, and so I'm really grateful to have you as a partner uh, working with me at the State House. Um, and finally, I, I want to again uh, lift up residents. It is the voice of residents that I think are, are so, so important as we think about uh, the number of changes. Uh, the unprecedented challenges, uh, the issue around our, our climate crisis here, uh, all of the work that we have to do and the need to do that work together as a city, as a community, as neighbors. And I know all of you have been very active. And so I'm grateful for the opportunity to come and, and speak with you, um, but really to hear what is on your mind, to hear uh, the questions, the, the ideas, the concerns, uh, what you would like to see uh, for uh, your own neighborhood. Um, I certainly know a number of uh, issues have come to light. Um, everyone obviously is concerned with our waterfront and how we protect ourselves from flooding. And I know you heard from uh, Chief White Hammond, um, and this is of the utmost importance not just to protect our climate, but we have a real opportunity to make sure that we are uh, preserving some open space, that we are uh, prioritizing people, that we are creating jobs as we think about climate change and how we uh, battle uh, climate change. And so I am grateful uh, to you for your work and uh, to all the residents here who uh, care about these issues. I also know uh, there are questions or concerns around uh, traffic flow uh, here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Thank you for that. <laughs> that I, I see, I come from the tradition of the Black church. And so uh, there's always that call and response. So I, I really appreciate that. That was the amen corner right over there. Amen. Amen. Uh, in particular, I um, have been hearing and certainly want to hear from folks here uh, about uh, State Street, I think, in particular. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and the plans there. And I'm certainly open and want to make sure that we are taking, um, you know, the issues that you are bringing forth and that we are responding in, in such a way that meets the needs of the residents uh, uh, in this community. Um, and not just the residents who live here, obviously that is very important, but we know that this is an area where a lot of people uh, come because they are either visiting as tourists or, or maybe they are supporting one of the businesses. Um, and so we need to make sure that it works for everyone here. I know the uh, loading trucks, the, the commercial vehicles that come through uh, create another challenge um, you know, to this area. And so we want to make sure that we are doing things in a responsive way, that we continue to prioritize and lift up the voice of residents uh, who live here, who are deeply committed to our city, uh, to ensure that their needs are being met uh, as we think about uh, future planning and, and how we move forward uh, to ensure that this works uh, for everyone. Um, and so I really am here to, to listen, to learn, to connect with, with all of you uh, around these issues of importance uh, and, and any others uh, that might be of concern or any ideas uh, that you have. Um, I'm grateful for the team uh, that I have working with me, and I want to give a special shout out to John Romano for his amazing work as uh, one of our uh, neighborhood coordinators, and we can give him thank you. For that. Uh, you know, I can't do any of this uh, work alone, and you know, I am blessed to have a great team, but I feel even more blessed, and I'm deeply grateful for the number of residents who every single day are contacting our office, who are you know, starting their own uh, neighborhood groups or the friends of a, of a park or uh, you know, organizing around a, a food drive or um, supporting a local school, uh, making sure that our businesses feel supported. Uh, it is the residents of Boston that make all of our neighborhoods so incredibly special uh, and make our city uh, truly thrive. And we have an opportunity moving forward to uh, continue that work, to build upon that work, to make sure that as we uh, battle the pandemic uh, and hopefully put the darkest days behind us, that we can create a stronger Boston and a Boston that works for all of us, where there's shared prosperity and opportunity uh, and where we're looking at the obstacles as opportunities that we are, you know, see uh, anything that has been in our way uh, as a way to create something better than what was here uh, before. And so that is the work that I hope to continue to do with each and every one of you, um, whether it be tackling a state street and, and really looking at that issue. And I understand that there have been some uh, good plans uh, or drawings that have come from this group. Um, that uh, take into consideration pedestrian safety, which is very important to me as someone who does not own uh, my own personal vehicle, um, but want to also make sure that we, what is that? I'm stunned. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you know, Boston's a very walkable city. It's a, a very walkable city. I am a big believer in public transit and, and promoting public transit. Uh, advocating for better public transit, making sure that it is uh, working for all of us, uh, working better than it currently does. Um, just a few weeks back, I launched a fare free bus uh, on a major uh, economic corridor as a way to uh, study that issue uh, as a pilot. Um, it is important that public transit work. All of us uh, bear the brunt of the burden from traffic and congestion in our city even when we don't own a car. You know, it is difficult for pedestrians to get around. Uh, if I am on a bus or now with, uh, you know, my security detail that drives me around, it's tough to get around. 
we all bear the brunt of the burden in terms of how it impacts our climate. Uh, asthma rates being high in certain areas, um, you know, road rage being a real thing that drives a lot of folks uh, to, to a place where none of us should really want to go. Uh, the answer to all of this is not a popular answer, but it's fewer cars. We don't want traffic. We've got to get cars off our roads. Um, and, but, you know, we are, we've become a city uh, that is dependent on cars and the city has been built for cars. And so it is important that we, uh, you know, look at our infrastructure and make sure that we are creating opportunities uh, for different ways of getting around our city. But we have to do that with residents in mind, with businesses in mind. We have to make sure that we're putting forth thoughtful plans uh, that will work uh, for this particular area or any particular neighborhood uh, that we might be uh, speaking about. And so, um, you know, I've been proud not to have a vehicle because I, I like walking, I like taking public transit, I like uh, getting around our city, and I don't want the hassle of having to worry about where to park uh, my car or, 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 or you know, or all of that. And in addition to fewer cars, I think the cars that we have, we have to embrace electric vehicles. Like there's lots of things that we can do because obviously cars are not gonna magically disappear. That would be, nobody, you know, people are gonna hold on to their cars and they have one car instead of two or three. You know, those are, those are other issues that we can uh, look at. But we need, the city has a role to play in terms of the infrastructure and making sure that our, our streets work and that uh, there's safety, uh, particularly for pedestrians. So I'm really interested to see uh, and hear more uh, from the residents here and the businesses own, owners here around how we can um, take a look at what you've come up with and, and see if that is the direction that we can go in uh, from, you know, from the city perspective uh, as we're thinking about not just this street, but you know, other streets uh, throughout this neighborhood. Um, you know, there have been a lot of challenges that have been made worse by COVID-19. Um, and we see that playing out in, uh, in different neighborhoods all over. And so we're gonna continue to make sure that we're listening to residents, uh, that we're hearing from our business owners, uh, and that we are coming up with solutions uh, that work for folks. So I am grateful uh, for the opportunity to be here with all of you. Um, and I'm not sure what your format is, but I feel like I've been talking a long time. I need some water. If I'm gonna keep talking, I'm gonna need some water. Need some water right now. Great. Yeah, thank you. Would you like to uh, to take a few questions? I'm happy to take a few Great. questions, Mark. Thank you so much. Yes, sir. Let me. Uh, oh. <laughs> he, he beat you to it. Are go you going to moderate? Uh, no, yeah, it's, go ahead. <laughs> yes, sir. I appreciate you. Um, well, I'm, I'm, Could you tell me your name? My name is Ken Breed. I live in Harvard Towers, and I've been so good in Boston. Uh, I was born in 92, too. Um, I'm not. Uh, interested in your view about the uh, Master Harbor plan and uh, the garage uh, post development on the Harbor Tower garage site. And how do you see this process moving along? Do you, would you anticipate a total revisit of the Master Harbor plan or just a few small fixes or, or what? Well, as someone who has been mayor for the last four and a half months, there are a lot of plans that were underway that I am taking a closer look at. I think as I understand this plan, uh, the two choices that have been put forth are a choice between a garage that currently exists or a big tower. And I believe that we can think bigger, uh, that we have an opportunity to look at our waterfront uh, to make sure that our waterfront is, is working uh, for all of us, that we all have access to it, um, and that we're doing more to protect um, our city from flooding. And so I, I think of the two options as being a false choice, and I think there's a real opportunity to do something uh, here, uh, but not just here. I think all across, I mean, we have so many neighborhoods uh, from East Boston, to Dorchester, to the South Boston, um, that are all on the water. And there's a real opportunity to think about um, our shores in a different kind of way. And so I want us to think bigger. 
Not even hair bigger. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. I like this church. <laughs> no, not bigger, taller, bigger in terms of opportunity to, to really uh, make sure that we are doing everything one to protect ourselves and to really mitigate uh, the climate crisis, um, that we are preserving as much open space uh, as we can that we are creating opportunities for residents of all ages to enjoy uh, the beautiful uh, waterfront property that we have here, um, that we're not you know, blocking the views and, and, and create, particularly on the shore. And so right now, I appreciate that there uh, was a plan in place and lots of people, lots of smart people have, uh, you know, have done some work there, but I think, we can do better than a tower or a garage. And so when I say bigger, I really, what I really mean to say is better. So let's think better. Yes. Uh, I'm Matt Rubens, I'm also at Park Towers, I'm a trustee, and uh, the 1200 residents there are, when you talk about issues that animate a lot of energy, uh, maybe just, just to follow up, others in the race have been more specific about what the proposal is, whether it's, of land swap that Barrows has proposed or others. I'm just curious if you could maybe flesh out a little more specificity of the process, whether it's, if there is a process underway now, as you're aware, there's a process going on. But what we're trying to understand is what would a JD administration look like in terms of what would actually happen in terms of community engagement? Well, community engagement is going to be a very important piece of anything that we uh, do, whether we're talking about this particular parcel or anything in the city of Boston. You know, my background is in organizing and advocacy, and I prioritize throughout my entire career lifting up uh, the voices of those who are impacted by uh, decisions uh, that are being made. Uh, and they shouldn't be made on someone's behalf, but with them in collaboration, uh, which is why I'm happy to be here to kind of talk about State Street or uh, the tower slash garage uh, project or anything else. And so there will definitely be a process in place um, uh, to relook at this plan, uh, as well as making sure that we are hearing uh, from residents and other stakeholders, um, businesses uh, that are also impacted, uh, making sure that we you know, have a, a plan that is informed uh, by those who are directly impacted by anything, any decision or any changes that would be made. Um, I know that you were prepared by your staff about the State Street traffic problem, but State Street is not the only traffic situation in the neighborhood, as anyone can tell you. Um, and the development of a garage, whatever is done, would directly impact the horrific traffic situation that currently exists on, I'm going to call it Surface Road Atlantic, um, the main thoroughfare right in front of the hotel. Um, it's not just State Street. There's, made, there's a major gridlock traffic situation down here. Um, and a lot of it is for good reasons. A lot of it is tourists. A lot of it is you know, the financial district and people coming into work. A lot of it is, is healthy and good reasons. But please take that into consideration when considering further development. And also please take that into consideration with further traffic studies that need to be done to time these lights and get all this taking advantage of modern technology that's out there and available to try and make all this work more efficiently, please. I would agree. I think that uh, is wonderful feedback. Thank you so much for sharing. Uh, specifically, there is also a need to deal with the uh, commercial uh, vehicles that come through, particularly the, the larger uh, trucks. Um, there doesn't seem to be any coordination that, that happens uh, there, and so I think uh, not just in this area, but in, in other neighborhoods um, that are receiving large trucks, there's something that we can do to try to 
uh, make sure that there's better coordination so that it is not contributing to an already bad situation in terms of these challenges. So I appreciate um, that. And it's Thank not you. just State Street. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Sure. Take him I always take precedence over our chairperson. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, uh, thank you, Mayor, for being with us this evening. My name is Juan Cayon. Uh, I live totally over across the West Broad Street. Um, and I have two comments. Uh, my comments quickly uh, I own a parking space in my building, but I don't own a car. So, the fact that you don't own a car uh, and that you really don't need cars in downtown. Um, my other comment to you is I'm also human of press. And I want to thank you for uh, getting your city employees next. I, I do. My question to you. We're about Boston will soon get uh, a significant proportion of money from the federal budget in the state. Or Representative Nicholas is going to send as much of his pocket to you. Uh, <laughs> right here first. <laughs> <laughs> what, just list two or three of your primary focus for how you would spend anticipate. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so last week we uh, launched uh, a new task force, the Equitable Recovery Task Force, uh, to engage residents. As I said to the other gentlemen, it's really important that we are making sure that we uh, are hearing the voices of the people who will be directly impacted when it comes to spending hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, this is an amazing opportunity for us, and I want us to think big. We know that there are some goal areas uh, that we want to target uh, just because we know that these have been longstanding issues. Uh, housing in the city of Boston has, has been a crisis. That was a crisis long before COVID-19. Uh, but it's not just building a bunch of new units. How do we uh, make sure that there are more uh, opportunities for home ownership in the city of Boston? We have two thirds of the city um, that are renters. And so this is uh, a new opportunity for us, not just to build the housing that we need, but to make sure that there's more home ownership and that we are tackling uh, the wealth gap here. Uh, we know that health and wellness is still uh, an issue. Um, and so we want to make sure that we're investing there. And, and workforce, as we think about, you know, what the new workforce will look like, how many employees will continue uh, to work remotely, um, how many will uh, change careers, how do we invest in workforce development and make sure that we're tackling uh, income. Um, there is obviously opportunity around climate um, and, and so many other areas. The community engagement process that the task force is, is going to be launching involves surveys, uh, going online. Um, certainly people uh, will, they will have the opportunity to come to meetings. Not everyone is tech savvy, so we wanna make sure that there's some uh, safe in-person opportunities to weigh in on how uh, this money should be invested and over what period of time and where we should start first. In addition to the money uh, that we'll have at the city level, our schools will have their own part of money. And so we also want to make sure uh, that that funding is being invested uh, to support students and to support their learning uh, as best we can, including looking at uh, their buildings. Uh, we know and learn the hard way um, that our, our school buildings are not what our children need. Some new buildings are coming up, but all of our children deserve city-of-the-art facilities. Uh, with working windows and air conditioning and all the things that we need to keep the air pure. Uh, we've already seen from climate change that, you know, we saw 90 degree days in May. Um, we saw a record number in June. Um, 
lots of rain in July and, and again in August, the month when it's supposed to be cooling more 90 degree weather. So we have an opportunity there to invest. There's uh, closing the digital divide that we need to be looking at. Um, there are lots of opportunities, but I wanna make sure that we uh, have people coming to help inform that work uh, and those investments. And so that's how we go coming forward on those issues. I'm gonna just not to go with this. Well, <laughs> uh, and then I probably have time for just a couple more. Sure. So I'm gonna go, I see uh, the gentleman in the table and the woman sitting in the back. So Mark. Uh, Mayor, uh, you know that we're very concerned about sea level rise and about uh, developing a resilient, climate resilient community. Uh, chapter 91 is an important piece of legislation that helps protect us, but we are also concerned that it limits the possibility of the solutions that are um, probably the only way for us to protect ourselves. Can you share with us some thoughts about the balance between existing legislation and the need for changing that to be able to deal with resilience? Well, I would say this, and I'm uh, happy to invite uh, my chief up, but I would say, you know, we don't have to be limited by anything existing, whether that be a harbor plan, uh, whether that be anything legislation, uh, we have an opportunity and must take advantage of this moment to say we want better, that we need better. Um, because of climate change, because of what we've seen with COVID and how that has just exacerbated existing challenges that we're already facing our city, um, a number of them being systemic inequities um, that were here long before the pandemic. And so I'm not looking at approaching this work of being limited by what already exists. I think this is our opportunity to think about and reimagine Boston. When I was first sworn in as mayor, I talked about recovery, reopening, and renewal. For me, that renewal is how do we reimagine what we need in our city and how we're going to meet this moment uh, in our city, not just here in Boston, all across our nation. Um, and we have federal resources and hundreds of millions of dollars that can help us do that. We also have a political will uh, in terms of uh, record number of people uh, who are in office who, who get this and want to do better. And then we have residents who see, oh, wow, we don't have to go back. For me, I've been a broken record on this. We cannot go back to the way things were. That is not the goal for me. The way things were was hurting us, whether we acknowledged it and admitted it or not. And it's hurting all of us, not just poor communities of color. It is hurting every single one of us. And so the status quo uh, is, is not good enough. This is our chance to do better. And we can file new legislation. Uh, we can do things at the local level. We can put policies in place. We can do whatever it is that we think we need to do to meet this moment. So I'm not going to be limited by uh, anything that currently exists. And this is our time to think bigger and come back to bigger uh, and, and better. Yes, sir. And then the woman uh, after that. Thank you. Uh, I'm Matthew Murphy. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> I'm managing director of Boston. What was your name? Matthew Murphy. Mm -hmm. I'm managing director of Boston Harbor City Cruises right here in Long mm -hmm. And um, yes, we are a residential neighborhood. We are also a center of tourism, uh, hospitality. Uh, as you've probably heard, Boston's uh, hotel market has been on the most devastating in the country. Um, you know, along with that are cultural institutions here, such as aquarium, museums, sightseeing tours that have been a very, very difficult time um, over this past uh, time of COVID. So my question is, what is what are your thoughts on how the city of Boston is able to uh, help support this vital sector? Industry is the third 
in the city of Boston. There's no question it was just devastated by the pandemic. Um, you know, the number of people who lost their jobs, you mentioned hotel workers. Uh, they, I mean, hotels are just empty. Like this isn't just, you know, maybe things will get better and we can do take out it, you know, at a restaurant. This was, there aren't any people uh, coming. Um, and uh, it's been devastating. And there are real people who are impacted by that, not just tourists who are not able to come uh, to our city uh, the way they were before. The good news is Boston is Boston. And so we will recover uh, and we will make sure that we get a very strong, robust economy, including the hospitality industry. We've already been making investments uh, through our Office of Small Business, uh, through the Office of Economic Development to support our small business owners uh, with a number of grants uh, and support. I've uh, recently convened restaurant owners who have had all kinds of challenges, even though many of them were able to stay open because they could shift to takeout or have the, the Uber Eats and Grubhub uh, bring food to folks. They have not been able to uh, attract and retain staff. One thing that came out of that discussion was uh, that we would provide uh, bonuses, so recruitment bonuses, but we're not going to stop at recruitment bonuses because many of the folks would come, work for a couple of weeks, maybe a month, and then be off to the next. And so we also will go further and make sure that there are retention bonuses for folks who stay. Um, we've already invested about $16 million, closer to $17 million in supporting businesses uh, in Boston, and we want to do more. We've been also uh, working uh, closely with some of our larger vendors, uh, Fenway Park, TD Garden, um, all throughout the reopening process. You know, had lots of conversations with folks as I was preparing to reopen the city uh, back in May, uh, because we know that folks have been hurting. In all of this, though, we have to continue with a public health response. Our public health response is very much tied to our economic recovery. And so making sure that we're doing everything to get people vaccinated. Yes, an employee, um, every city worker in the city of Boston is a vaccine mandate. And we have a phased in approach where those who are working with high priority populations are going to go first. Everyone is going to be uploading their, their information um, to an online secure portal. Uh, but we have to get everyone vaccinated. And it's not just the city of Boston workers. We'd love to have uh, other uh, employers do the same for their employees. We are leading by example. We continue to lift up um, all the ways that people can get vaccinated. Um, you know, earlier in the pandemic, we had four-pronged approach with the mass vaccination sites, the community clinics, the priority clinics. Uh, and my favorite uh, was the, or continues to be, uh, the mobile vaccination clinics. Um, lifting those up, we had it at Gospel Fest. We're doing a lot of back-to-school events, uh, getting our children back into the classroom is a huge priority. We, this is going to be the third school year impacted by the pandemic. And our children are hurt and our families are hurting. Um, and so we've got to make sure that we're doing everything possible to get people vaccinated. That is the best way that we will rebound um, in terms of our economy. And Boston is strong, but it can be stronger. And Boston, fortunately, will continue to be a city that people will want to visit. Uh, but we've got to make sure that even if uh, some of our office towers are seeing a certain percentage of workers work remotely, that we're giving people a reason to come into our city. And so how do we activate space with art? Uh, how do we make sure that there, is, there are other reasons uh, for folks to come into Boston to make sure that they continue to support and not just uh, you know, hotels, uh, but all of the, the retail space, the restaurants, um, you know, and not just here, downtown. There's an opportunity to make sure we are showcasing our neighborhoods. You know, uh, back in April, I think it was, I launched the all-inclusive Boston campaign, which highlighted 
our neighborhoods and all the amazing uh, things uh, that made them great. Uh, and so we want to make sure that as people visit our city, uh, that they take advantage of, of, of seeing uh, all of our neighborhoods all across Boston and us as residents. We can get off our little corner in our favorite coffee shop and we can go check out another neighborhood and support. And so there's a lot more work to do, but we are making these investments because it is critically important for our future. Yes. Um, I got one more in the back. She's been waiting so patiently. What's your name? Welcome. I am certainly um, thinking about that, and I don't want to um, make any grand announcements here. Uh, so what I would do, uh, what I would do is I would love to uh, follow up with Mark, who can help uh, communicate with the larger group um, about our, our thinking there. Um, I, I want to be real clear without making any grand announcements. It is a false choice to think that our only option is a large tower or a garage. That is a false choice. We have the opportunity to think bigger and better about our waterfront and so many other uh, issues here uh, in the city of Boston. That is what I am encouraging us all to do. And I think, I will say this, I think you'll be happy uh, with what I will be doing in the future, but I don't want to make any grand announcements here. Uh, but <laughs> but even inquire over here. Um, I, you know, it's just it's a false choice. We have an opportunity to do something better that will protect um, Boston from flooding, that will create uh, open space, that will. Um, create jobs, like there's a whole industry here. This is back to your question about our economy. Um, and so we can do better than what is currently on the table. I'm gonna leave it at that before I get myself uh, uh, into trouble. Um, but uh, stay tuned, okay? Listen, I wanna thank you. I wanna thank each and every one of you for uh, your amazing questions. Uh, for your engagement in the back and forth. I really uh, did appreciate that. Um, you know, I can tell that this is a very uh, engaged uh, community. Um, and I am looking forward to your engagement, whether it be the federal resources that we are able to invest, whether it be your thinking around traffic and congestion uh, and how we are tackling those issues, whether it be on our climate crisis. I really do appreciate the opportunity, and I know if we continue to work together, we can get there together to a stronger Boston, a Boston that is more equitable, more just, and more resilient. So thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Mayor Danny, for being here with us. And Chief White Hammond, thank you very much also for uh, sharing your thoughts. Uh, I'm delighted to see so many people here uh, to um, be able to ask questions and to hear your answers. We wish you continued success going forward. Uh, our, our next meeting is. Um, all right. Well,
Tuesday. Third Tuesday. We'll get you the date on that, of course. Um, and um, uh, that one will be back to Zoom, I think, because uh, uh, but we will keep you all informed on that. This has been a very special time for us to be together in person. We'll see where this all takes us, right? But uh, thank you all for coming this evening. And thank you very much to Stephen Johnson and the Boston Harbor Hotel. Just moved here. And we were so excited about coming. So we 